Welcome to the short vignette lecture um, for segment target and position as part of the ABS A-Level business lecture series. Uh, we sincerely hope that you find this content useful and that you'll be able to use it for both your AS and your A-Level studies. So today what we're going to look at predominantly is segment target and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on uh, position also known as STP and this typically is content that supports the first year of your A-level studies. Most of the time the options within the syllabus are covered for this particular material in the first year. Now the fundamental truth is that up until about 1920 the concept of segmentation and therefore targeting and positioning was mostly unknown in the developed world. In the 1920s Increased market sizes led to the need to adopt different ways of engaging targeted audiences for the purposes of profitability fundamentally. So even in the 20s when Ford launched the Model T Ford, they were still dealing with mass marketing uh, because you could have any colour that you wanted as long as it was black. You could have any body that you wanted as long as it was a certain coupe style and you had the choice of one engine and one set of wheels. So very much a mass marketing approach. By the time the 1980s um, came around, hypersegmentation started to become identified. This was because there was considerably more competition in the marketplace and fundamental naked um, value solutions were very difficult to come by. So the purpose of this hyper segmentation was to allow organizations without a unique product to be able to place themselves in a market and deliver some sort of perception of distinct value to their core audience. To put this in real context you can go back to 5000 BC and forwards and you will see that humans have been adopting segment target and positioning approaches and the Silk Road is one example, the, the road between China and um, the Middle East and Europe uh, is one example of such a sort of segmentation target and position approach, even though it wasn't called that at the time, because certain traders would use certain routes to certain markets. It was distinctly STP. The end of hyper um, segmentation came as a result of one-to-one -one marketing. And a great example of this is the, 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 the concept of the Tesco Club Card, which if they had the agency, the people to be able to do the analysis, would have allowed Tesco from the 1990s onwards to be able to individually segment, target and position the company towards an individual. Now this is really the case, although there are some examples of very, very successful one-to-one -one marketing. So that's the overarching sort of background. What we'd really like you to get from this session is just consider the concepts of segmentation, targeting and positioning and explain the various segmentation bases, for example, that you could um, utilise. Typically, they're formed into four distinct sets. But again, because of this hyper segmentation, uh, there are a lot more segmentation bases that you then can adopt. We'll briefly explain what those various segmentation bases are uh, with a few examples. And then we'll move into outlining the process to effectively target a priority market. And there's a key there, a priority market meaning the market that as far as the organization's concerned is the, that the target that is most likely to deliver long or medium term, most profitable business. Then in that context, we'll take a view of positioning and positioning fundamentally is just the perception of an audience or a person that a product provides a certain benefit and is preferential to other products or services in that offer area to the competition. So in this context, for example, we'll take a look at total addressable market for target markets. We'll ask how big is the market fundamentally, that's market potential. And we must also consider that this dovetails quite nicely with Porter's generic strategies, where he evaluated undifferentiated focus and differentiated approaches 
to what I'd say is mass sort of segmentation of the market. So segmentation. Segmented markets is the foundation for superior performance. Now it's quite a bland statement and it's quite difficult to justify unless you think about that a little bit more carefully. What that really means is that there are customers out there that will find the inherent value within your product or service more preferential to other customers. And it's your job as a marketer to be able to identify where they exist, how many of them are there, and how you can communicate and deliver your product or service to them. This really relies on your understanding of how buyers needs and wants vary. And these variances in needs and wants is essential design in effective marketing strategies. Now, obviously to do this, we'll be using the elements of the seven Ps, which is the marketing mix, which you should have covered to this, at this point, I would imagine, uh, that of product, price, place, promotion, people, physical evidence, and process. So we can utilize and pull those levers to be able to ensure that our targeted customers, our segment that we want to appeal to most, is addressing the right audience. And effective segmentation is one of the most critical factors in developing and implementing effective marketing strategy. Why? Because if I develop a position for a target audience based on segmentation analysis, which is suboptimal or possibly even incorrect, then I will be spending a great deal of money in trying to win business that won't have any appeal to my product or service. And in this context, we also have to think, how much resource does the organisation have to undertake a segmentation activity? What sort of product variability do we have? So what products are available to the market and how do they vary in their key benefit? It also depends on what part of the product life cycle your product or service is in. If it's very early to introduction and it's quite a novel product, the amount of competition is going to be fairly mediocre. When the product re reaches the main or the ma majority of the market, at that point we know that many, many customers will be in that market. They will be wanting products and as soon as there's many customers in the market, there will be many providers of solutions to that need also entering that market. And similarly, certain segments are much more competitive than others. The grey generation is not one that's appealed to most uh, fast moving consumer goods producers because they're at the point where they're closest to death. So fundamentally, an FMCG, a fast moving consumer good company, is going to want to capture your millennial or Gen Z um, generations because they know that if they capture you with value that you find useful, then they will keep you for many, many years and that profitability will persist, hopefully. Apologies for that slight technological issue. Um, typical basis. This is probably something that you've covered already or possibly have covered already. And these are the typical bases whereby people consider uh, how we can segment audiences. So geographic, for example, customers within two mile, within a two mile radius of the M6. By this, what you're probably, your, your, your target really, your segment is probably commuters up and down the M6 and what their needs might be. So just think about some sort of service station. And within geographic, we can consider customer location, we can consider regional, urban or rural type of environments. And a classic way of approaching this is the ACORN CACI uh, framework, which if you click the link on the presentation on your Blackboard, you'll be able to find a description of what ACORN CACI does. Demographic, I could consider A-level students as being a segment you are fairly self-similar. You probably want very similar things. So thereby, demographic A-level students, I might consider your age, your gender, your occupation, your socioeconomic grouping. So obviously within A-level students, you will be between the ages of 16 and 18. Your gender will be one of several 
uh, binary and non-binary choices. Your occupation is probably that of predominantly a school or college person, but that doesn't mean that you won't have other activities that you take part in that might be revenue generated. And similarly, you'll come from different socioeconomic groupings. And these are all sort of sub-constituents of demographic segmentation. Behavioural, customers wanting value for money when they impulse purchase. Well, that's quite an odd statement, but some customers buy on impulse and they are motivated to choose to make a decision because of value for money constructs. Within behavioural, we think about rate of usage. How often do you use? Where do you buy from? When do you replenish? What benefits do you, do you seek from the actual solution? How loyal are you to the organisation? And then realistically, what the time frame of purchase is? Is it going to be an impulse purchase immediately? Or will it will be a high involvement, long term purchase, like choosing the right university to study in, which you should be considering for at least 12 or 15 months before you make your final choice. And then finally, in the classic or typical basis, psychographic customers who prefer not to use single use plastics could be a psychographic mechanism. Really, what we're looking at there is attitudes towards single use plastics. And again, the millennial or the Gen Z cohort of which you should be a part um, have very different views on single use plastics than somebody of my generation, for example. In there, we'd also look at personality, lifestyles and, and also class systems. And use just another way of looking at some of those. So use situation, occasion, importance of purchase. So for example, if I was getting engaged to the love of my life, then they may require a ring as part of that transaction. And so the importance of that in purchase, use situation is much more significant to me than maybe buying the eternity ring 10 years after we've been married. So you get some idea that consumer markets can be constrained by these types of element. A simple way to think about this is if we think about segmentation and we think about behavioural or demographic. If you take a look at um, Nike for example, Nike have an awful lot of basketball shoes. Traditionally it was Air Jordan and for the traditionalists amongst us, people my age, we sort of associate with the Air Jordan sub brand. But now they're into the Kobe and the LeBron James um, models as well and that fundamentally is a cultural segmentation they're actually segmenting on cultural similarly with online we can actually now segment on online behaviors so not behavioral but online behaviors uh, how long you spend online where you go online what you predominantly do online and what types of sites do you visit whilst you're online and you probably know this, but Facebook and Google is capturing that experience, that digital footprint in real time and selling it to professional marketers like myself, who can then use it to target segments with a position that I think will, they'll find appealing. So really, when we're thinking about segmentation, what we're thinking about is how mature is the market? So how much competition does it have? How educated are the consumers within that market? What competitive structure does, does exist? So for example, uh, Coca-Cola is a market leader in, in drinks, soft drinks predominantly, um, was desperately trying to get into the smoothies market, came up with its own products, was uncompetitive because innocent smoothies sit in the UK alone, uh, managed to corner that particular market. And they decided that their segmentation and their, their positioning required them to purchase Innocent from the founders so that they could actually enter the market and grow the market. And they've done exactly the same now with the purchase of Costa Coffee from Whitbread about 18 months ago. And similarly, organisational experience. Large organisations with good consumer experience kind of understand their segments very closely. When they develop in products, they're developing them with a specific segment in mind. And they can also determine how they can broaden the usage experience for those targets so that they can build out and grow the market. But fundamentally, what we're saying is that 
segments have to be identifiable, so they have to be roughly self-similar, they have to be accessible, that is, I'm, I must be able to communicate to them in some way or other, and ideally they will be financially attractive, otherwise why would I spend millions of pounds of revenue every year on maintaining my understanding of that segment. So that's a little bit of background on segmentation. We're going to move briefly now on to targeting, um, because once we've identified the segments that appeal to us, what we're then going to do is try to determine which of those groups of segments, those homogenous bases that we want to target, because we can identify them, because they're accessible, and because they're attractive to us commercially. So targeting and position strategies consist of defining, deciding even which segments to target. And when we've decided which segments to target, we then have to design and implement a positioning strategy for each target and then go down a marketing communications activity to be able to communicate either through push or pull communications, um, a way of telling our audience about the fantastic product or service that we have. So targeting, if we just think about demographic, we could target to children, but then even then, when we think about children, there are six to eight year olds, they probably need to have a strategy where the children are persuading the adults. Nine to 14 year olds in the, in the stage of adolescence, um, we probably need to have some sort of strategy to target the influencers um, of those, their peer groups, their friends, and possibly some of their extended family reference groups. And by the time they get into 15 or 18, we're trying to appeal to them directly and communicate to them in a specific manner. And that's an example of what's known as a single variable demographic target. So we've said that these targets should have some sort of structural attractiveness and it's always coming back to similar components competitors in the marketplace are there any if there are how do we position so if i'm trying to launch a new soft drink which is like a, a vitamin water how do i find a space where i'm not going to be out competed by the pepsicos or the coca colas of this world are there substitute products that I need to be aware of? Because somebody doesn't have a product within my segment, that doesn't mean that there aren't substitute products. And fundamentally, can I differentiate in any way? Now, a bit later on, we'll talk about the difference between differentiation and positioning. But differentiation is a unique attribute that a product or service possesses. So for example, if you think of Uber, that has a distinct differentiating component, which up until about 18 months ago was largely uncompetitive, uh, didn't have any competition in that space. Now, are there some substitute products? Yes, there are. They're starting to grow very slowly, but they do exist. And in this targeting strategy, we're thinking, how many targets do we want to enter? Because ideally, as soon as we enter a market, a target that we're after, then our comp competitors will be watching us and they will follow a similar approach to us. They may even then jump to the next targets before we get there. But fundamentally, commercially, what we're thinking is which targets appear to be the most valuable. So this is exactly the type of content that we cover in the Aberystwyth Uni University entrance exam. So the entrance exam is an exam that you can take multiple times a year. You can see that on the, the link there. Uh, you'll be able to see when you can take it. But when you successfully complete an exam, um, you could earn yourself an unconditional or reduced offer for the business school. Uh, if you're interested in that sort of content, please take a look, um, but not in class time. So then fundamentally, we then come to positioning. And positioning is about perception. Because if you think about it, when you purchase your iPhone, the only difference between an iPhone and a Motorola Moto G7, with a, with a few small sort of performance differences, is your perception of what that phone does. Because 
an Android, a mid-level, mid to low level Android device provides pretty much identical user experience and capabilities attributes as the iPhone 10. But the reason that you want the iPhone 10 is all down to positioning. And this was a, a masterpiece of marketing by Steve Jobs in 2007 when they first released um, the iPhone, where he quite easily through a perceptual map showed that his phone was smart and his phone was easy to use and his phone had all sorts of different capabilities, being that of a music player, a web browser and a phone device uh, when comparing to the contemporary products of the time. So from that point in the smartphone market, competitors have been desperately trying to either take some of that position away from Apple through a perceptual change or outcompete Apple on several areas. One of the fundamental areas is that, for example, an S10 um, phone from Samsung, the Galaxy, is a more technically proficient phone than the equivalent Apple, but it's about two to 250 pounds less expensive. So positioning can be done obviously on price. We can position against competition. We can position within a category. We can position by a product benefit, or we can position by a product attribute. These are just a few of the different ways in which we can position a product. Now positioning as a concept really emerged in the industrial landscape in the late 60s through some just fantastic work by Rees and Trout. And if you're ever bored and you fancy a quick read, read Positioning by Rees and Trout because it's a wonderful book that will take you about an hour to read and is just fantastic. Similarly, a gentleman called David Ogilvy, again, another very, very interesting market, sort of advertising um, author as well as being a very large owner of a communications organisation, is the other person that's considered to be um, the position installment. But the bottom line is that originally products were positioned with more competition in the hyper segmentation areas from the 80s and onwards then it's not just the product that's being positioned, the brand is being positioned, the experience is being positioned, and a whole load of other wrapper elements are also now, now positioned. And when we think about positioning, what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine how an audience perceives our product. And the classical way of doing that is through something called a perceptual map. And in your own time, I would strongly recommend that you take a look at, say, for example, Coca-Cola's perceptual map or the Apple iPhone perceptual map or any popular consumer durable that you may wish. So the four C's of position is a way of trying to determine that when we position, we position effectively. The first one is clarity. Does the target market understand the differential advantage in clear terms? Do they feel that they understand what the difference between company A product and all the other products similar to company A in the marketplace? Consistency, how do we maintain a consistent message? So if we think about some of those wrapper elements we were talking about for product positioning earlier, some of that position is by the social media interactions how do we maintain a consistent brand image across social media channels to make sure that our message is consistent and our position isn't made or doesn't go out of focus? Credibility is what we're trying to say believable. If they don't believe the claim, then they're unlikely to believe your position and therefore they're not going to take any fundamental notice of what you're saying. And then competitiveness. Is the advantage important to the customer? Because if it isn't important to the customer, um, why would they remember to form an attitude about you? So Burberry has positioned its brand in the minds of consumers to be a functional luxury. Now that's an interesting point, a functional luxury. Well, luxury by its definition is a symbolic benefit and function is something that it provides you with directly. You need clothes to stay warm, that's a functional attribute. 
Burberry maintains a product line with great width and depth consisting of many products. So there's many styles and within each type of style, there's many different varieties. And their products fall into one of two main categories, fashion, i.e. things which are popular now, or continuity, things that have been popular for years or decades. A little back dress is the classic example of a continu continuity product. So what I'd like you to do now for five or ten minutes is watch the video and then answer these questions. Please describe the brand transformation process of Burberry. What were the main reasons why Angela Arendt's were so successful with the brand transformation? What are the main motives between behind sorry, the product line extension from the original Bur Burberry trench coat into other product areas? And how does Burberry positioning strategy address the four C's? Okay, so I've assumed that you've watched that video and attempted to answer those four questions. What we're going to try and do now briefly is we're going to try and think about something called the positioning statement. So the positioning statement is the, the tool that the mark, professional marketer would use in an organisation that would serve as the foundation for all of the positioning efforts. Now it's often possible to position against more than one variable or attribute, but realistically what we have to do is we have to consider the audience and the contact within which they see the communication and within which they would use the product. We need them to understand the fundamental value proposition, the value proposition being the key benefit, or to put it another way, the compelling reason to buy and the action components that will be used by the company to deliver the value proposition to the audience in the context identified. So we're asking really is how unique and how do we create a perception? Now, for this to happen, the whole organization has to buy into the position of the product or the brand. And without doing that, success is gonna be very difficult to achieve because if we're about, um, reaction times and half of our personnel don't realize that speed of answering questions or delivering things is part of our core mission and our values, then our position and statement is going to be basically undermined immediately. So to do this, we're going to follow a series of steps. We're going to establish the competitive frame. We're going to determine the current perceptions of consumers about the product or brand. And the way that we do that is we do perceptual maps of our products against, say, for example, price and quality or safety and reliability. And then we'll do equivalent focus groups or even other qualitative research for competing brands. From that, we'll be able to see where our product or service fits into the competitive space. Within that, we will be able to develop possible positioning themes. Now, our position has to be unique. If we're trying to copy somebody else's position, all we'll fundamentally do is reinforce the position for our competitor. We'll then look at the positioning alternatives to select the most appealing. So we'll go through a gating process by which we look at the alternatives and we will prioritize those that we believe will be most effective in gaining traction for the segment in the target market. Then what follows will be the development of a marketing mix strategy, possibly for overseas markets, possibly for internal markets. And in that context, we will have some KPIs, key performance indicators that will allow us to monitor effectiveness. Obviously, one of the key KPIs will be the amount of revenue that the product has generated. So if we think about this, Volvo positioned itself, Volvo as a car manufacturer, it positioned itself as the safest automobile in the world, and it positioned itself as an executive car. So it was safe, fantastic, everybody wants safety, um, unless you can block. 
But it also positioned itself in the executive strategy because the executive, the executive environment is where the greatest profits are made. For example, an Audi is considerably more profitable than a Skoda, even though they share many, many of the same components. So these are the steps. Establish competitive frame, determine current perceptions, develop themes, select prioritize themes, and then create some communications that allow you to communicate that to your target segment. To do this, we'll use something called the positioning statement, which is an internal tool. It will help me identify my target market. It will provide a reason to buy or a point of differentiation or perceptual difference. And it will also guide the marketing effort. So we're going to go through one or two. And then the final thing that you're going to do is that you're going to briefly um, consider your own version. So we have to convince business managers and professionals engaged in making time sensitive decisions about international business that DHL delivers on time because its pickup, transportation and delivery system is wholly owned and managed by DHL personnel, not by third party providers. So the perceptual difference that we're working on there is that DHS, DHL owns the holistic distribution chain and they're not using third parties because the assumption is that third parties are unreliable. So they're convincing the target that DHL, what they want to position, delivers on time and then they're substantiating it because. Okay, let's take a look at Virgin Atlantic. They're convincing customers of business and leisure air travel that Virgin is the best choice for air travel. That Virgin will get the traveller to where they need to go safely, on time and at a reasonable price because Virgin focuses on creating an environment where passengers love to fly and where employees love to work. So we can see that the position there is on getting to the right place safely, on time and at a reasonable price. Now you might argue that how is that position any different to British Airways or Lufthansa for example? And this is where they're using the because Virgin focuses on creating an environment where you love to fly. Now they're telling you that so that's already a linguistic bind and where employees love to work because the differentiator for air travel is the engagement that you have at the service interaction points. So what you're going to do now is you have a try at trying to do your own positioning discussion for a segment. I'm going to give you five minutes to draft yours. Um, I'm assuming that your teacher will pause this so that you can go through this process. Um, what you want to do is convince an audience that your company is better because of some attribute. So. Your chosen brand in this for this little assignment is going to be either on this link, any of these, which is an interbrand top brands of 2018 link. Apologies for forgetting the parenthesis at the end of 2018. And you can see them in this link here. Now these are brands. So what you're creating here is you're creating a position for a brand, but should you so choose, for example, Toyota, you could take a look at GT86, which is a four-seater sports car, which is very driftable. For Amazon, it could be about software as a service providers. For Microsoft, it could be about, you get the idea. For Coca-Cola, it could be about a new product, or it could be about trying to reinforce the fact that occasional sugar drinks are not a problem. So have a go at doing that. All you have to do is go into the convince that because go back to the examples that you saw on the previous two slides and you should be able to have a crack at that. OK, try and do it in about five minutes or so. OK, so the assumption is that you've now finished that exercise. There are two also supplementary exercises on the blackboard that you've logged into this with. Um, for those supplementary exercises, I suggest that you work through them. I'd just like to tell you a little bit about um, Aberystwyth University and the business school in particular. Um, 
We're very, very highly respected for our teaching. In 2018 and 2019, the Times Good University Guide voted as the top university in the United Kingdom for teaching quality. Um, it's never been done before. We're very proud. We work very hard at teaching. The National Student Survey in 2020 voted us the second best marketing department in the United Kingdom, the third best finance department in the United Kingdom, the ninth best accounting department in the United Kingdom, and the 15th best economics department in the United Kingdom. We are a small-ish university, so this is very, very uh, positive results. The Guardian 2020 rankings for business and marketing were both 16th in the United Kingdom. We take teaching and producing highly employable graduates very seriously and this has been reflected in, in the fact that we are gaining the very highest accolades within higher education in the United Kingdom. Thank you for your time. Um, this is one of numerous options you will have to go through content and we sincerely hope that you find it useful. If you have any questions then please use the Blackboard Stroke course sites that you logged into and I will happily take any questions that I see. Thank you very much for your time.